Hi, TBN family. Welcome to TBN Meets. My guest today is known for his influence on contemporary worship music, uh, writing well-known worship songs like uh, King of Kings Majesty, and is an author and speaker. He also leads Revive Church in Hull in uh, East Yorkshire. Jared Cooper, it's so finally great to meet you. Great to meet you. So you came down on the train this morning? Yes, yeah, all good. Everything good? Good British trains. How many people do you get saved on this journey that the Lord put you oh, on? Oh, multitudes, multitudes. Yeah, I saved a, a, <laughs> an egg sandwich on the way down, I think that's about it. <laughs> so it's so great to finally have you. Um, and uh, first thoughts, TBN, it's your first time at the TBN yeah. studios here? Stunning. It's really cool, isn't beautiful, it? yeah. You can see the hand of God's favour on it. Yeah. And uh, really exciting to see what's going to come from all this. Absolutely. Well, a lot of people will know you. They've, uh, a lot of people would have sung your songs, but they uh, probably might not know of you or your story. So yeah. we're here today to talk about that. I want to speak about these exciting books you brought out uh, a little bit later as well and, and what, what kind of the, the ideas behind them and what God is releasing through those. But let's talk about your story. Tell us where did it all happen? Where did you grow up? Your testimony. Okay. I, I'm a Welshman, so uh, around about 1970, was born in, in Wales, land of revival. A great place, into a, into a church, a large Pentecostal church. And uh, when I was about seven, my parents felt called to go on the mission field. So my first memory, really, uh, of, of the call of God, uh, as we went to live abroad, my dad had a good job, they owned, owned a house. It was, uh, we had a comfortable life. And then one day my mum came to me with a pillowcase and she said, you can only keep the toys that you can put in this pillowcase. Wow. So I knew something was going on. So, so we ended up s selling all of our stuff. I remember the day we opened up our house to all the neighbours. There was a price tag on everything and just the neighbours bought everything, toys, furniture, the lot. And then we, we set off and everything we owned was put into a Citroen 2CV6. Do you know what they are? A little yeah. French bubble car. Yeah. And we, we headed off homeless, jobless, into the call of God, down into Europe. And <laughs> I remember the sobs of my mother more than anything. Uh, that, an act of obedience looks great afterwards but at the beginning of the testimony often it's the sobs that you remember this is oh. painful and so we went off into what seems painful but actually it was wonderful i spent 10 11 years in in the mediterranean my my dad led a church there and it grew well and then then we came back but in my journey there i kind of I, I started to get involved in music and worship teams and stuff like that and by a series of events i ended up by about 19 years old i was in full-time ministry as a worship leader and really everything has grown from there um, even though i lead a church now and, and 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 i love doing that i still feel like a worship leader leading a church mm. and my passion is the presence of God really to 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 build a church that has the presence of God vibrantly in place I always say if God's presence came because of juggling I'd have been a juggler <laughs> but God's presence moves around worship and that's that's why I Absolutely. love worship so so I traveled itinerantly for about 15 years and then the last 12 years I've been leading the church that I lead now so uh, speak yeah. to people about worship yeah. yeah we get to so many places and uh, invites in UK specifically you find the worship is often vastly different denomination to dom denomination. And uh, why is worship important? Worship's important because it's, it's what we were born to do more than anything. God is, if you read the Bible beginning to end, God is seeking connection. And so it, it's not about singing songs. It's not singing songs that's important, even though I, I, I'm a songwriter and I love all that kind of stuff. For me, the, the center of worship is always this. If you look at the beginning of the Bible, God wants to walk with man in a garden. The whole story of the Bible is God reconciling man to himself. And the end of the Bible is God living among man again. So that is the grand theme. For some reason, beyond my understanding, God is obsessed with us. He, he, he made us for one reason and one reason only, to love us, mm. to be with us, to know us. Now, we don't get that because half the time we don't like ourselves. So how can a, a holy, infinitely powerful God be so obsessed about us? That's the great mystery. But when you get it, oh, it will set you free and it will also make worship about what it is really. It's not about songs. Worship is about meeting God. At its root, it talks of a kiss or of a prostration before him. So for me, the heart of worship is it's, it's let's create an environment where people can meet God. That's the power of it. That's so good. So speak to us about um, 
how do we, in your case specifically, what is the, the because we, we each one of us have a very specific purpose. God is, we, we by design, we here to do, we have a function. Yep. What is the unique thing that God is saying through your ministry? What, what if, you know, what is that, that thing that God is taking to the world yep. through you? Let me put it this way. When we lived abroad, my grandfather died, my mum's father. And so she flew over and he was already dead and she, she went to, to the morgue to kind of say, at a psychological level, goodbye. And so she turned up at the morgue and they, they laid him out and he, he looks fine and everything in her as a daughter, uh, a grown up daughter, w wanted to reach out and pat his hand and say, it's okay, dad, everything will be fine. Because it was to her eyes, her dad was laying there. The moment she touched him, she knew he's not there. That's mm -hmm. not him. Now, the point of my life is this. When people touch the church, do they say, God is in that place? Or do they say, well, they sing about it and they're quite nice people, but I wouldn't say God is there. The Apostle Paul to the Corinthians is trying to tidy up their corporate worship. But even that, in that environment, he says, unbelievers should come in, fall down among you and say, God is in this place. So my heart is this, that we should not be a church that doesn't have God among us. I, I kind of get what people mean when they say church is all about people. I, I understand there are some ministries that are more wired to, come on, let's, let's be happy and healthy and make this a home for people. And that's good and right. But there's another aspect to church. Church is supposed to be the house of God. Come on. And so when people walk into church, they should go, God is in this place. We, we do radio programs and they're taken from our Sunday services and they get edited quite heavily just so that nothing unusual happens. But if you read the Bible, you can't take the unusual out of the Bible. Absolutely. You do that, you're, you're ripping out half the Bible. And so these people turned up at, at one of our services and they, they walked in and they only ever heard us on the radio for 23 minutes uh, every Sunday. <laughs> and uh, they walked in and they began to shake violently under the power of the Holy Spirit. Oh, and one of them oh. wasn't saved. And so I walked to the back realizing, I think these are guests, I'll, I'll go and say hi and, <laughs> hi, how are you doing? And there, there they both were, shaking violently, and they said, it's not like this on the radio, <laughs> is it? And, uh, and that's the thing, you know, uh, we edit things out for a radio show or to, you know, that's certain <laughs> standards. But when people touch our lives, they should go, God is in that place. Not they're nice, good community, nice singing, you know, well put together, all that's good. But if we are doing what we're supposed to do, they should go, oh my goodness, God is real. Someone just got out of a wheelchair, a blind eye opened, a deaf ear opened. I felt God in the room. That's what I live for, to just reconcile people to God. Not to me, not to a ministry, but to say, this is God, humanity, meet your maker. And just see God move among us. That's my passion. I love that. Let me put you on the spot a little yep. bit. Why do we see so little of that across so many churches in our country? Because I think we have fallen for the, 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 perhaps the teaching, an ever so subtle teaching, because we can look at the, the outside of great churches. No church is as great as its website or its TV show. <laughs> and, and so we look at the outer, we look at the, the style of the music or the style of the preaching and how well it's put together. And I believe that's a God thing. I'm not against that at all. But at its core, men of God should be on fire, men yes. of God, on fire, women of God. Um, if it's in the Bible, it should be happening. The dead should be being raised. The blind should see. People should sense his presence. Prophets should be prophets. In other words, it's easy to sanitize the church and humanize the church and take the supernatural God element out. And I believe some of what we see around the world is doing that. Mm. The reality is you can attract a crowd. It doesn't mean you're building a church. Amen. Donuts or lights or good music can attract a crowd. I want to attract people to Jesus. In other words, they go, Jesus in this place. So that means love and approval and fun and laughter, but it also means miracles, might, holiness, and things that, well, look at the early church in the book of Acts. They were causing riots. Such was the sense of God upon them. And that's what church should be like. We're not here to please the world. We're here to introduce the world to God. Absolutely. We, we're here to, to set the world alight, set it on fire. Yeah, absolutely. And I find it very interesting, you know, I get all these stats and different things from the church and blah, blah, blah. I hardly ever, you know, take it all very seriously because some of these sample groups are just so weird. But what I find interesting is if we had to do a sample of all the leaders 
let's just take the UK for an example. We can take any country to, uh, and see how many of them has actually encountered the Lord. Mm. And they're leading flocks, they're leading sheep. By what? By what inspiration? By what is, and I think that's what we find often is that DNA. And so leaders, I believe, need to get the fuego, as they call it in South America. Yeah, the fire. Get the fire of God yeah. on them. Yeah. And, uh, and have an, a, a true encounter with the Holy Spirit. Because mm. that will transform your ministry. Yeah. You cannot be the same once you encounter the presence of God you, and the power of God. You can never long for a meal you've never tasted. Exactly. You long for things you have tasted. And the problem is that people mm. can get awesome. as far as leading a denomination and never had a God encounter. They're saved. They've, been, they've sensed the Holy Spirit but some have never seen a miracle, and I would question whether you can be an apostle without seeing a miracle, a Come sign on. or a wonder. Um, uh, and they've never personally encountered God in that way, and so they don't know how to lead in that way. Mm. And so what we get essentially is a whole load of churches that are, let's say, Pentecostal in creed, but not in reality. Yeah. And in fact, we're raising a generation at the moment of people that aren't quite sure what speaking in tongues is about. They've never experienced a move of God. Mm. Um, and in fact, they even, the scary part is sometimes ridicule such things. That's when right. what I think is, if it's in the book of Acts, it should be happening today. Absolutely. Well, let's move straight into that. This is a platform where we have viewers watching from prisons. We've got people watching from their lounges, from hospitals, uh, from villages in Africa. Yeah. This goes out across Europe, across the UK, across Africa right now. And what a wonderful opportunity to to help someone pray for the infilling of the Spirit. Yeah. Let's, let's do whatever the Holy Spirit wants to do. We don't want to get in His way. So will you pray for our viewers, whatever you want to do, whatever God puts on your heart right now, into this camera, yeah. if you will, and uh, let's release something. Okay. Let people experience God, the yeah. tangible Spirit of the Lord, because yeah. He's available for you, right at wherever you're watching from. I believe you'll feel the power of God wherever you are. And we do these things with an open hands and we receive it like a gift. So I'm going to ask uh, Pastor Jared just to pray for you and uh, just release whatever God has on his heart. Let's, okay, let's do that. Yeah, um, I've known God touch lives remarkably through come television. On. In fact, I lead a church today because of a word of God brought to me through television. So I just want wow. us to expect God to move in lives right now. So let's pray wherever you are right now, God is there. Yes. I might not be there, but God is with you in the room right now. And I ask for his Holy Spirit to come and fill that room. The first thing he filled in the book of Acts was a room. And I pray right now that he'd fill the room or wherever you are right now with the power of his Holy Spirit mm -hmm. and let his spirit fall upon you. And I command sickness to leave bodies. Come on. I command depression to leave. And Lord, I ask for a release of the power of your Holy Spirit right now. I pray the Holy Spirit would fall on people and they would speak in tongues for the first time. In the name of Jesus, let your spirit flow over every life that's watching this program right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. That's wonderful. Thank you, Pastor. So let's talk about that song of yours and uh, the yeah. songs you wrote on 20 albums. Yeah, yeah. So uh, your... The big song. How did God inspire that? The man who wrote one song, they say. <laughs> I did write more, honestly, honestly. No, there's something remarkable happened with that song. In about 1996, I encountered the glory of God. I was on a plane flying down to South Africa. Mm -hmm. And I was on, a, let's say, an inexpensive flight, such as my faith at the time. So, you know, outside toilets, luggage on the roof rack, that kind of place. And I was taking a night flight, so you couldn't see the sellotape on the wings. It's a pretty rough airline. And uh, it was a long flight. And I remember waking up in the middle of the night and I, I couldn't see the plane. I had a vision of the glory of God. Wow. And I lay there terrified in the plane for a while and, and fell asleep again. Got to my hosts in South Africa and, and uh, each night for quite a while, just the glory of God would keep appearing in, in the room and I would encounter him. And he, he gave me visions of the United Kingdom with the glory of God moving across our nation, the glory of God hitting parliament, hitting the royal family, hitting oh, the media. Um, get gatherings of thousands in city centres with people getting out of wheelchairs, which we've seen in this nation up in Hull, and uh, deaf ears opening and blind eyes opening. I believe there's a move of glory going to hit the church in an incredible way, because God's ultimate end is that his glory is going to cover the earth mm. as the waters cover the sea. So we've yes. got a guarantee there of what the end's going to look like. Now, in that whole period, 
I began to write about the things I was seeing and experiencing in, in the mid-1990s. And one song that came out was this King of Kings Majesty. And the chorus goes, in royal robes I don't deserve, I live to serve your majesty. Mm -hmm. And um, it, 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 yes, it is about robes of righteousness, but it's also about God clothing the church in glory. Mm -hmm. And there's a glory that we don't deserve. The Bible says that those he, he predestined, he called, those he called, he justified, and those he justified, he glorified. The, the end game here for Christians is that we're supposed to be glorified. Now, you'll never understand it till you get that you're justified. In other words, because of the cross, it's as if you never sinned. But when you begin to grasp that, we can begin to be like Peter who can walk down a street and people are getting healed around him. When we grasp the power of the gospel, the glory of the gospel can break out around about us. And that's what that song's all about. If we learn to encounter God in his glory, realize you might be weak, we're all weak. You might be needy, we're all needy. So God's never worked with a perfect man yet, so let's give up on that one. But we can be clothed in his glory because of his mercy. Absolutely. And that, that's what it's all about. And I've got so many, there's, there's something on that song. I've got so many stories uh, in South Africa, um, uh, uh, drunk, alcoholic, suicidal woman was walking past the church and they were singing it. She walked into the back of the church, fell to her knees, gave her life to Christ, <laughs> went on to work for the president of South Africa. Wow. Um, uh, 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 they used to play it, in fact, in, in a South African radio station. They used to begin their drive time program with the song every single morning. Wow. And I was on the, the radio show one day and the, the DJ said to me, we used to play King of King's Majesty at the start of every drive time show. And I thought, that's great. He says, but then we stopped playing it and we got a phone call. It's a thank God that you've stopped playing that song. And I thought, this isn't a very nice story. But he said, <laughs> and he said no, let me finish, it's good. This woman would be driving to work every morning and she'd be halfway to work and King of King's Majesty would come on. And she said, the presence of God would fill the car. I'd have to pull over and sit and cry my way through the length of the song. Then I'd dry my tears away afterwards and get back off to work. She said, for the first time in two years, I'm going to get to work on time because you're not playing that song. Wow. So it, there is just something that my heart is I want people to meet God. And somehow it got onto that song. And I've been in incredible meetings around the world with people just on their faces for hours wow. encountering God. And I wish I could put it in every song, but you know, it's just God did something with that. It's a very simple song. Yeah. For some well, reason, it's sung around the world. It's the same as, um, you know, Matt, who speaks about ten thousand reasons. Yeah. It's the same thing. Absolutely. It's it's the songs. It's really quick release from God's heart yeah. uh, to our ears and to our hearts, and, and something amazing happens. And that's the fingerprint of God on Absolutely. something. And, but whether it's a song. And by the way, um, Jared's written songs on over 20 albums just for the rest of us to just take note of that. But also, you're an amazing author. And uh, I like what you said earlier, that there's a, there's a new era of glory coming. And that's what your book, 500, is all about. Mm -hmm. When was this released? So I'm just going to hold it up to the camera quick. So the 500 is the 500th. Uh, anniversary of the Reformation. Right. So I wrote so that it. That was end of last year. It was end of last year. Mm -hmm. Last summer, I spent two months on sabbatical praying. And in the middle of that, I was actually down in London mm -hmm. at Greenwich. And I just felt the Spirit of God begin to talk to me about this 500 year anniversary and wow. how important it was. And in two days, God downloaded 27,000 words of prophecy that is the book. Wow. And I sent it straight to my publisher. He hardly had to edit it, and he had it out within weeks. My goodness. Um, it's a, it's, it's a, just a very prophetic book about the times we live in. Essentially, it's, it, the, the, the core of it is this. Every 500 years, God changes what he's doing in the earth. There's a, a different way of interacting with man. If, you, if we go back as far as Abraham, 500 years after Abraham, you get Moses. 500 years after Moses, you get David. 500 years after David, you get the exile. Right. 500 years later, Jesus. Then the beginning of the Dark Ages then the depth of the Dark Ages and the Great Schism in the Church. Then 500 years ago was the Reformation. Mm -hmm. So these major marker points when God adjusts like a battleship turning in the sea, what he's doing in the earth, we're alive at one of those. If you were born within a few right. decades of that 500 year marker, he is about to change and do something remarkable. Now, I believe we are alive at one of those major change times in history. Now, if I look globally at what God is doing, 
and globally at what is being prophesied. Right now, for instance, there are more people raised from the dead than ever in history around the world. There is an incredible move of the miraculous. I've got a friend, they've seen nine raised from the dead. They have a resurrection team. If somebody dies, they get called in to pray for the dead body. Um, and then they've got acquaintances that have seen hundreds raised from the dead. Yeah. There's something going on in the earth right now. Yeah. And I, I realize that your average person is taken up with the school run and paying the mortgage and, and going to church that sometimes isn't always that exciting. But if you were to pause and look at the world from a high mountain right now and say, against the span of history, what's happening in the world right now, you would say we are at a remarkable, pivotal point of history where never has the gospel been more available right. and never, for instance, has there been more people healed on the streets around the world than right now. The Welsh Revival saw, some would say, about 100,000 people saved. I've been in a single service with Reinhard when over a million got saved. That's right. Ten Welsh Revivals in one night. Something is going on in the world. You are alive at an incredible moment. And so that book, 500, is saying you're alive at a 500 moment. And I go on to show from all the prophecies and all that God is doing in the world that what that means is he is releasing a glory on the church like never before. And that's what that is all about. Where can people get hold of this? At you, all good bookstores? Yeah, all good bookstores, at, you know, your, your online retailers and then our own website sell the book as well. I love that idea. The very idea that right now on the earth there's more Christians than there's uh, more saved people than there's been in the history uh, in heaven right now yeah. is quite a phenomenal idea. And that's why, if you think of everyone that's in heaven right now, you know, there's more saved people on the earth at, at this very moment. And uh, we can do this. You know, we, we can really get, and this is up to all of us. It's, it's all of our jobs to get people saved. We need to get people encountered. And we need people to be introduced to the love of Christ mm -hmm. because God is a loving God. He wants to, he wants to meet needs. He wants to encounter people. He wants to really touch people's lives. And, uh, and I love what you say because the fire of God is what needed in this nation. The, the power of God is what transforms. Jesus, when he walked up to people, he didn't say, hang on a second, let me tell you about myself. He said, what do you need? Yeah. And it, faith followed an action. Yeah. And uh, that's so encouraging. Tell us about this book, When Spirit and Word Collide. Now, this is out for a few years now. Yeah. This came out in 2015. Yeah. So... Tell us about this. Wh when I went into church leadership, my, my passion is presence and power and prophecy. Right. And that's, that's my background. And I love to see God move and all that kind of stuff. Then I got into church leadership. Um, and uh, the, the church grew well for a while, you know. And I, I, mm -hmm. I, I love to create these environments where God is moving. Uh, but also there came a point when we started to plateau and I, I you know, so I thought, well, I, maybe I'll, I'll prophesy harder or I'll <laughs> preach longer or, you know. Um, but I, what I realized in time is that I needed to grow my leadership skills as well as my ministry skills. And I realized ministry and leadership were two very different things. A lot of people are in church leadership because they want to preach and prophesy, but also to govern well is a spiritual gift too. Right. And only when the two come together can church really blossom. Church tends to end up in one of two places, small but powerful or large but dead. Now, Smith Wiggles have prophesied accurately up to now because there were stages in the prophecy in the book. He, was said, he ended it by saying there'll come a day when people of the spirit and people of the word come together and it would usher in the greatest revival the world has ever seen, eclipsing the Welsh or the Wesleyan revival. Right. Now, every other stage of this prophecy has happened. We are now living in the era of people of spirit and word coming mm -hmm. together. That's right. And so I go on to teach, well, what would it look like for uh, uh, churches of spirit and word to truly come together? So we end up with large, well-led, excellent, but spirit-filled, on fire, miracle-working glory centers. That is the church of the future. Not that we end up all in excellence, but dry. I know there are churches you can go to and they usher the people through and, you know, groups of thousands. And, but I, I know you can't sense God in that place. They don't even expect a miracle in the public setting. To me, that is not good enough. Then again, I know 
wild prophetic churches, but are so flaky that they lose people so quickly. Right. The two must come together. People must learn to get the fire of God back in their churches. And let him move, as if we should have to use that language, but we do. Let God <laughs> move. Apostles should be performing miracles. Right. And then over this other side, spirit-filled guys, learn how to lead well. Learn that it doesn't all have to be spontaneous and wild. Sure. How do we pull the two together? That book is all about my journey of pulling the two together that has led us into growth. It had yeah. to be more than just being a minister. I had to learn to be a leader too. And it had an amazing response. We, run, we now run an annual summit called Spirit and Word Leaders Summit. And we literally get the best word guys and the best spirit guys together on the stage. And we say, how can we build amazing, large and influential, but powerful spirit-filled churches? Because uh, I believe it's, it's the way of the future. Is that open for people to yes. attend? Yes, yeah, yeah. When, when does that take place? It takes place in March, early in March. Mm -hmm. And uh, registration is still open for that for this year, yes. Okay, so just go, if this, uh, if the Lord's moving on your heart with this, and I'm sure he is. Um, go to that website on screen right now. All the information is there that you need to get there. And if you've been hungry for the Lord and have a desire to feel what uh, Pastor Jared is speaking about, then get there and encounter the Lord. We've got about a minute and a half to go, and there's still two things I want to do. So I want to know what breaks your heart. Oh, really, religion? pseudo pretending at God, the, 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 you know, lip service, but heart's not there. Mm. Now I say it breaks my heart. It breaks my heart in this way. I know I can do it too. Mm. So uh, I don't ever want to pretend to be a shiny man of God to That's people. Good. I want people to realize I have to say to God, God, I think I'm running out of love even for you. Let's be mm. real about this. Get my backslidden heart on fire again. And I, I can, you know, I'm, what am I, 20, 29 years in ministry. Um, I remember talking to a young minister and he was, ah, he'd been struggling with my prayer life. I said, great, how long have you been struggling for? He said, two weeks. And I'm like, good heavens, two weeks. I said, when you get to about two years, come talk to me. Because to do this thing, to stay inspired, to be genuine and real in your love for God, in all this world of ministry where we also want to be fruitful and in a godly way successful, very hard to stay pure. But I got into this game out of pure love for God. I am a classic David in the, in the wilderness <laughs> playing my harp and singing. And so I really, it really gets on my nerves when I'm, I'm taken up with employment law and spreadsheets because I was born to be close to God. And it breaks my heart when I get that way where I realize I'm not enjoying you, God, in this. Uh, I'm not walking with you like I want to. The stuff is taking over. But it breaks my heart when my church goes that way and I look in their eyes on a Sunday and I go, guys, you're being religious. Let's not tolerate that. Let's not. Hey, man. Let's, it's, we want church with a capital C and in flames. We do not want to play games. And then it hurts my heart when I see that wherever. I want people to genuinely be connected with God. And when religion gets in the way of that or busyness or success gets in the way of that, we're missing it. Absolutely wonderful. I want to encourage you, Jared Cooper, um, we need more people like you leading the church. And I just celebrate what God is doing through your ministry and, and uh, we uh, hold up your arms and we expect great things uh, through your ministry that God's going to do because of your heart. So I want to encourage you, Jared Cooper, uh, when spirit and word collide and also 500, two amazing books that will just bless you. Go to any good bookstore. And uh, what we've discussed today in today's program is it in these books in more detail and bless someone with it today, why don't you? Connect with uh, Pastor Jared uh, via Facebook or Twitter, all the social media um, stuff is on, on screen right now. Also his website, if you in the whole area, get there Sunday, why don't you, to their church and uh, go experience more of God. Let's, let's use this new year to go to a next level in our relationship with the Lord. There's a world that awaits that's so amazing if you've not experienced the presence and the fire of God. Thank you so much for joining us today and sharing with us. It was wonderful having you. And uh, we, I'm sure you'll agree we'll have to have him back uh, for lots more. So we'll catch you again next week. Goodbye.